Thanks for joining us today. I'm Nancy Furness and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming today at City Centre Library in Coquitlam and we thank the library for giving us the venue to carry out these interviews. I would also like to acknowledge that the interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lie above and below. Today we're joined by Adam Bremner Aikens and Adam is the BC Green Party candidate for Port Coquitlam. So thanks so much for joining us today, Adam. Thank you, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to discuss some of the important issues this election and to let the public know where I stand. Well, thanks so much. We're excited to have you here as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and also about why you chose to run for the BC Green Party? Yeah, so I grew up in Port Coquitlam. I went to school in Poco. Um, it's where my character developed. It's where my family raised me to be who I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where I met my friends. It's where I began my uh, passion for organizing and my passion for climate change. Um, and really, it's about going back to my hometown and just interacting with members of my community and trying to make the world better for everyone. Mm. Can you, okay, so we're just going to jump right in. We've got a lot to talk about here. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is housing. As a younger person, you probably realize that um, it's hard to get into the housing market. The BC Greens have um, proposed um, creating 26,000 units of housing every year. Can you tell us a little bit about that housing? What kind of housing are we talking about? Yeah, I think building more houses is important but the type of housing we build is more critical we need to target people like you said young people lower to middle income people who have been priced out of this extremely high price market right. and we need to start by building social housing by building uh, non-profit housing by building mm -hmm. uh, more community housing so that people cannot well so people are not forced to leave their communities mm -hmm. that's a problem a problem for myself and so many of my friends in the community is you are either forced to live at home with family or you are forced to move out and away from the community right. you grew up in and the friends you have, uh, where the relationships you built are. And that's not a choice that people should have to face. Um, and even renters or uh, owners with mortgages and the price of housing, even buying unless you have a very high paying job is unrealistic. Right. Um, I, I think you've covered a, a lot of bases there. One question I do have, though, is you're talking about social housing, which we know that we need very much. How are we going to pay for all of this? This is an important question, and it's where BC Greens come in and shine. We talk about responsible fiscal management, uh, and part of that is reallocating existing funds away from inefficient programs. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is using federal money to uh, build new housing, and part of that as well is ensuring that the money we are using today goes into the right type of housing. Mm -hmm. The government currently is giving out a good chunk of money, but not to the right areas, ah. not to areas that uh, low and middle class families are impacted by. They're building um, these uh, new duplexes and triplexes, right. but that's just adding um, high cost housing to a market that is already high cost. They're not reducing the cost, they're just increasing the supply. And we need to target that so that the price actually comes down. And that's where these ideas like social uh, housing and not-for-profit housing come from. Okay, so you have to link those two together. And you're saying they're not linked, the housing supply versus the cost yeah. of housing. We could yeah. flood the market, but at the end of the day, if we keep building luxury apartments and large houses, mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to afford them. Uh, that's just not what everyday people can afford to live in. Right. No, I, I appreciate yeah. that. And I'm sure a lot of um, families out there and young people and seniors and everyone else appreciate those thoughts as well. Can we talk a little bit about renters? Yes. There's the Renters Tenancy Amendment Act. Um, can you talk about that proposal and what does that do? Oh, it's a wonderful proposal. Um, and I think First, it goes to show that even in uh, a government where there is a majority party, BC mm -hmm. Greens are still able to get work done. Um, Rental Tenancy Amendment Act, we're looking at preventing renovations. We're looking at ah, ensuring more okay. secure homes for renters, giving renters uh, more rights when it comes to unreasonable um, ends to their tenancy. Uh, 
you know, to ensure that people aren't just kicked out of their homes because they had a bad interaction with their landlord, for right. instance. Um, and to ensure that the housing supply is secure because people deserve to have a home, whether they own it or rent it, that they can feel is secure and that they can feel it's their home and not just somewhere they have to move from if their agreement ends. Well, I think that's one of the basic issues is having housing and being secure in that housing, yeah. right? So um, that's interesting and interesting how you also say that you were able to forward that without having a majority uh, um, in government so that your voices are being heard there. Yes, this is something BC Greens are very good at. We, there's lots of legislation, um, unfortunately lots of it that have been shot down by the current government mm -hmm. uh, and some that have made it through. Uh, but in the legislature, we're the only party uh, putting forward legislation that isn't in the majority and getting stuff mm -hmm. down, even though we're not fully elected to government yet. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, let's talk more about housing. Um, there's a lot to cover there. there so BC NDP government has recently implemented new provincial housing legislation. And in that housing legislation, they've mandated minimum density requirements for all municipalities over the population of 5,000. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a one size fits all um, housing strategy. Is this going to adequately address the affordable housing um, situation? No, I don't think so. Um, we saw when that policy was pushed through, it was quite rushed. There was zero consultation mm -hmm. with communities. We see today uh, municipalities like Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam uh, just are scrambling to try and even mm -hmm. adapt. The, the levels of infrastructure needed to add that many people into the cities in this style of housing is unrealistic to do within the time frame. And at the end of the day, these are houses that are being built on existing already expensive housing. So okay. this isn't adding in low to middle class housing mm. supply. These are just going to be the same expensive houses uh, that people will be forced to pay overpriced costs for. And that goes back to the idea of we need to ensure that social housing is built and not just new housing supply because the price isn't going to significantly drop unless we intervene and try and take profit out of housing and ensure housing is a human right for all British Columbians. Okay, interesting. And also, can you talk a little bit about livability of these kind of um, communities where we're putting densification in, but not necessarily talking about um, climate resilience or um, urban forests or general livability? Well, that's a huge issue. So ensuring that people have a sustainable place to live, mm -hmm. both ecologically and socially, is, is critical to community. And we have seen a failure to build, uh, say, the missing middle housing uh, to ensure that density isn't just all concentrated in towers. Mm -hmm. The rushing housing policy through government, like the NDP has done so far, because we miss really important uh, ideas like planning out communities so that they have access to all of the nature that they can possibly have because that's important for humans to be connected to nature whether it's to take your kids out or to take your dog out on a walk or just to go and distress along a nice walk uh, in a park. Right. Uh, that's important to have and if we don't sit down and critically think through how we plan our communities then we're not going to be able to access those areas and people are going to be cut off from nature. So what changes would you like to see um, as a Green Party MLA? What changes would you like to see to the housing legislation or to the way that we approach housing? Yeah. I would love to redo um, this action by the government, go back to the drawing table and consult with communities. See okay. what different communities need. We know that different communities have different needs. So not a one-size-fits-all no, kind of approach? We can't expect Burnaby to have the same needs mm. as uh, all rural communities in the interior of the province. Right. That's unrealistic. And, and the same goes for Quitlam. Um, we cannot expect a, all of Poco to have the same needs. Right. And we can also not expect that um, Poco is going to be able to adapt to these housing needs quickly. We need to bring in government support to allow them to increase their infrastructure. And this goes for all cities, to be said, right. um, to increase infrastructure so that we can accommodate all these new people and all these new housing projects. So you're talking about um, housing supply and costs not necessarily being connected and also about the importance of allowing municipalities to have their voices heard with respect to community planning and also concerns around the urban forest and climate resilience mm -hmm. and um, there's a, a quite a few issues there that I am detecting. <laughs> yeah. um, so 
Uh, we're going to move on from that. I, I know we could probably talk all day about that. Definitely could. But I want to talk a little bit about public safety. So Sonia Firstenau, the BC Green leader, has said, I understand that many people are feeling worried and uncertain about safety in our communities. So um, the issue is that we're seeing increased polarization and politicization around the public safety issue. How do we get beyond that and start working together to make sure that everyone in our communities feels um, inclusive and safe? Yeah, I think, I think this is an important one and it's something I've seen um, more recently in our politics. And I think at the end of the day, we need to go back to being a community. Go back to knowing that our neighbors are there for us when we need them. Going back to recognizing that people are just people. Mm -hmm. Some people are having a harder time than others. Some people need more support in different mm -hmm. areas than others. Um, and and to have like citizen assemblies so that we can, mm -hmm. as a society, sit down and come to a common agreement on how to deal with our problems. Can you tell us what a citizen's assembly is? Yeah, so a citizen's assembly is a wonderful idea uh, where you bring together a random group of, in this case we would be talking British Columbians, right. who come down and they discuss with experts uh, on issues, um, what approaches we can take and how we can solve our uh, issues, and they come back to the government with a report. Um, that is ideally as unbiased as we can get, that is informed mm -hmm. by the most recent data we have on issues from experts, and they say, hey, this is what we the people think should happen, okay. and we need to implement this to ensure that everybody is happy and we come to a common conclusion. Um, and that. No, I, I think that's yeah. an approach that we don't have right now, right? So it's it's an interesting thought um, and an interesting way to kind of. I don't know, strengthen our democracy? Well, that's exactly it. We need to get people back into government. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a very limited interaction. Most people have very limited interaction mm -hmm. with government. You get an election once every four years for your provincial government. And aside from that, sometimes scandals pop in the headlines and there's right. some discussion. But bringing people back in to make choices in government is critically important. There's a reason we elect MLAs, and that's to serve as the people's representative. OK, so I just want to go a little further down that path that you took us down um, and talk about voting age. So the Green Party is proposing lowering the voting age to 16. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why? Yeah, I think a lot of people are beginning to realize now in the digital age, young people are more connected to issues than ever before. Okay. Um, we see, we know a lot of young people are already having jobs, they're paying taxes, they're involved with current issues, they're impacted. Um, as Most housing definitely, is an issue. yes. If young people want to move out, either, you know, between that age of 16 to 18, or even if they want to consider it in the future, right. they don't have the ability to impact government. Mm -hmm. And as much as there are concerns, um, we know that youth are more educated now than ever. They have access to more resources online now than any generation in the past. And we know that 16-year-olds um, uh, to 18-year-olds when you get those age groups involved in democracy, mm -hmm. that lasts. Yes. That goes on for the rest of their lives, and we can strengthen our democracy by improving voter turnout, by catching people in high school and having them participate in our democratic processes. Right, because we do see voter apathy. Um, I know municipally um, in Port Coquitlam, it was like 18% of the people yeah. came out to vote. 82% of people did not even feel engaged enough to come out and you know fill out the ballot yes um i have one more question yeah. for you and it's as a new mla and also as an mla um for the green party who is not likely to hold a majority government how are you going to get your voice heard and how are you going to get things done should you go to victoria i agree and there are concerns fair concerns about Greens not being the majority but I can say our history proves that we don't need a majority to make substantial mm -hmm. change in government we look back at the 2017 minority government before it was collapsed by the NDP mm -hmm. that was some of the most useful time in government in terms of passing policy why we got um, corporate and union donations banned, we got cap limits right we've got new climate change in the clean BC program through government we have so many significant policy issues in that small period of time done right. compared to the four years of this now NDP government. We look back at that time and that's when progressive change happened. Mm. We tied minimum wage to inflation to ensure that workers won't fall behind. 
and there are so many um, other policy issues that if we get a, even a few greens in government, mm -hmm. we will see strong change on. And I have leaders like Sonia Persno and Adam Olson to go in and who will be able to teach me, if elected, how to be the strongest advocate I can be because the two of them have stood up for British Columbians mm -hmm. and they have gotten policy passed even in majority governments. Well, for a small number of MLAs, we certainly do hear a lot from them. So I think what you've said um, bears out, right? Yes. Can you tell us, Adam, what is your number one issue? If you get to Victoria, what are you going to be working on? It's going to be sustainability in both socially and, uh, and environmentally. The two in my mind are interlinked. Yes. Um, we cannot have a society that is socially unsustainable mm -hmm. and that goes back to affordability, cost right. of living, housing, um, but we also cannot have a society where we're destroying our environment where the government is making um, terrible fiscal choices like in putting five, over five billion dollars of taxpayer money into LNG Canada. Mm -hmm. Both an issue that is economically unsustainable, unsustainable but also an issue that is environmentally unsustainable. Uh, LNG is not the future for our province and the fossil fuel industry entirely only makes up 4% of our province's economy. Surprising, isn't it? Because it is they surprising. get a lot more attention than 4%. That, that's exactly it. And when you look at just the subsidies for LNG Canada, that's one third of the overall GDP contribution of our economy. One third that's of that. That's way out of is Exactly. It's balance. They're not a profitable industry. Hmm. And the government has pushed them because they're close with LNG lobbyists. There's lots of them within the NDP and there's lots of them outside lobbying government to put these policies through. But at the end of the day, $5 billion, mm -hmm. we can do so much more for British Think Columbians. of health care, education, exactly. the environment. New transit systems, yeah, transit. new SkyTrain lines, so much. Transitioning to yes, cleaner yeah. energy. Yeah. And ending that is an example of both sustainability, socially and environmentally. It's the fact that we cannot afford to keep destroying the environment. Right. No, I appreciate that. You have a, a very worthy goal and a lot of work ahead of you. It's true. This is, but you know, BC Greens, we like to get stuff done when we're mm. passionate about policy. And I think that's the difference for all of us candidates on the BC Greens is we're not just going to government because we see problems, mm -hmm. it's because we've been impacted. Adam, is there anything else you want to talk about um, with respect to housing? Yeah, I think going back to this argument about um, Increasing supply doesn't affect cost. Um, and well, I'm sure if we flooded a million or two million homes mm. and we dropped the cost. You saturate, yeah. oversaturate. That yeah. doesn't benefit anybody and that's right. a wasteful use of money in just our economy. And land? Federal. Yes, exactly. We need to protect land. We need to ensure that farmland here in BC is protected. Uh, but to give an example, that one that many British Columbians know is look at the amount of luxury apartments and condos that have been built. Right. We're thousands and thousands of new units. And yet the price of housing keeps going up. And this is, comes back to that critical issue of this simple housing band-aid that the NDP has put out about just densifying existing mm. land doesn't work to serve. It's the same concept as these luxury condos. We need to target housing from the beginning with low cost, with non-profit solutions, so that everybody has access to cheap housing and not just luxury condos. Right, so, so to make it accessible for yeah. everyone. And I, what I hear you saying, I think, is that um, population and, and demand has gone up, but supply has gone up much more, and we're still not solving that crisis. Yeah, we just have more expensive homes and a lot more luxury condos in our market now mm -hmm. than we need. We, what we need is not luxury condos, but non-profit uh, housing so that people can have a safe uh, and stable place to live in their communities mm -hmm. because nobody should be forced to leave their communities due to cost. Adam, thank you so much for coming in today and, and sharing those thoughts with us. We'll wish you all the very best in your campaign, um, and I hope that we can talk again in the future. Thank you very much for having me, Nancy. It's been wonderful, and I hope to be back soon talking about real important issues to people. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Nancy Furness. This is We've Got Issues. And we've been talking to Adam Bremner-Akins, uh, the BC Green Party candidate for Port Coquitlam.